welcome to the stage, Eamon Leonard. Hello, 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 hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One more time, good afternoon. Yeah, there we go. Everybody's full from lunch. You having a good web summit? Yeah, sounds like it. So, uh, my name's Eamon Leonard. Uh, delighted to be able to talk you through the content this afternoon. Uh, we have lots coming up. Uh, we'll take a close look at enterprise and industrial AI, why marketing and sales are critical to every SaaS business. And we'll be going full throttle a little later as we look at how Formula One is utilizing cloud technology. Uh, as you guys may have been around uh, to other talks today, you, you might know we have a great facility to, uh, for you to ask all our speakers some questions uh, right from the comfort of your own seat. It's very simple, you open up the Web Summit app, click on your profile, top left corner, then click to Sildo Q&A, at this stage, SAS Monster, and you submit your question. So, onto our first talk. Hands up who knows what APIs are. Okay, good stuff. For the rest of you, think of it like building blocks for, for web technology. So, uh, research has shown that companies that adopt APIs see increases in sales, net income, and market capitalization. APIs are driving growth and opening up new opportunities for companies to deliver their revenue streams. Integration is the new currency in the modern service economy. So, here to illuminate an often difficult topic in conversation with CEO of, IME of iMedic, Andy O'Donoghue, Please welcome one of the earliest pioneers of APIs, the founder of Mules, MuleSoft, Ross Mason. Thanks, Eamon, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, good afternoon, Ross, and thanks for being here. Hi, and it's great to be here. So we, we were just watching from backstage, and uh, when Eamon asked everybody if they knew what an API was, more than half the crowd put their, their hand up. I, I suspect perhaps the number is bigger than that, but anybody who's ever been online has probably used an API. Yeah, every time you use your phone, you're using an API. Okay, yeah. and so your firm essentially has created um, an API platform as a service, but you're also an incredibly important part of the API economy. Just explain for us generally, because for many of us it's a new concept, what is the API economy? So the API economy is, as the world is going digital at an alarming pace, APIs are the way in which digital, digital providers exchange value with digital consumers, right? So, um, you know, that means whether you're consuming maps from Google or you're using payment uh, gateways through Stripe or, you know, telephony services through Twilio, those are providers and the apps that use them are consumers. And the API economy is really changing the way businesses actually work together. So rather than these, you know, in the old days you do a, a deal with a, a business partner, it might take, you know, 12 to 18 months and you'd integrate products. APIs allow many businesses to, to cooperate and interact in an ecosystem. So for example, Uber as an app is an ecosystem of providers, right? It's, it, you know, Google Maps is used as the front uh, facing application interface. They use Stripe for payments, they use Twilio for communication, they use you know, a bunch of other things. And what you end up creating is value chains of APIs. Mm. And the revenue generation of those APIs is the value you provide in that value chain. Mm. Okay. And so from a MuleSoft perspective then, um, you're, you appear to be very committed to this idea that, um, and Eamon referenced it in the intro, that companies that focus on creating an, an API first um, an API-led company, increase revenue, faster uh, time to market, greater length of opportunity or runway for opportunity. What, why do you think that is? It's really simple. If you think about what the web has shown us, right, is the web is made up of about 20,000 APIs. And I'd look at these as software building blocks. They're just Lego bricks that you can stick together to create new products and services. Now, what we've seen happen on the web over the last 10 years, thanks to like, the smartphone, but also the apps on that phone, is we've seen millions of people collaborate in many different ways and build new products and services on top of existing software building blocks. Mm. That basically is the way all software 
on the web works, what's happening now is every company, every new company that gets built also works the same way or should be working the same way. And the big divide is actually most you know, enterprise companies such as big banks and, and insurance companies and mm. telcos, they're only now trying to unravel their com internal complexity so they have the same building blocks, so they can be more agile, they can move faster and drive more innovation. Mm, okay, um, and by the way, and we are using this, the uh, Slido app, so if anybody has a, a question, you can slido.com, hashtag Web Summit, and choose the stage, and we'll see if Ross will answer a couple for us towards the yes, end. Sure. Um, from the acquisition of MuleSoft, uh, if you don't mind talking about it for a couple of minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was a, a big event. Um, uh, so tell us a little bit about, not so much how it came about, but um, uh, when did you think it was, gonna, it was gonna happen, and what do you think actually was the trigger? Uh, the, when it actually happened all very quickly, so it yeah. wasn't like a long-term, um, I know people know who MuleSoft are, but we're, we're, we're essentially, our mission is to help enterprises change and drive innovation and be agile by connecting the applications, data and devices. And we do that by connecting to those systems and then creating reusable software building blocks, APIs, that allow them to build new projects, new services much faster. And it, it's, it's a bit of an abstract concept um, for a number of companies in the past five years, but what's happened in the last two years is a real realization uh, around what digital transformation means for organizations is fundamentally changing the way they deliver products and services to their customers to change the experience and to change the, um, the way in which they work with other companies and you know, patients and, mm. and students, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So with that backdrop, what MuleSoft has been doing is, is helping pretty much the Fortune 2000 mm. unlock their, their, their assets, their data, their capabilities within the organization through APIs. And what drove the acquisition was, I, I think, a realization by Salesforce that it doesn't matter how innovative your customer experience is on the front end, if you can't unlock your back end systems, mm. you can't move very mm. fast. And mm. what we're, we're really doing, we're, we're the dig, you know, digital engine for transformation, mm. right? We're helping these companies change and leverage the assets that they have. Mm. Do you think um, the timing for your for, for the acquisition of, of, of MuleSoft it was it serendipitous in the sense that um, data could move freely, storage prices were falling, bandwidth was there? Because unless we have great infrastructure or at least decent infrastructure, we can't su support API interaction. So it's interesting, it is fortuitous, right? So the fact that those elements um, sort of broke out and mm. became you know, either free or nearly free to access yeah. is super easy. The next big challenge of, of creating consumer experiences is connectivity, mm. right? It's the biggest unsolved challenge, right? Mm. If you think about the difference between a great experience with an organization and a bad experience, mm. it's whether it's connected or not. Mm. Whether I can see the things I want to see at the time I want to see them, whether I can you know, order online and then, you know, pick up, you know, and schedule a delivery through the mobile app. If I want to, um, if I want to see all my accounts in one place, mm. right, it, it's mm. those connected experiences mm. are really what makes or breaks the, you know, the success in the digital era. Mm. So with all the other building blocks taken care of, you know, the functionality, mm. the compute, the storage, mm. the next thing was, great, how do we connect the myriad and, you know, Myriad of things we already have, mm. but the explosion of new things. I mean, look how many startups are in this conference. Yeah. All of those are going to connect into other ecosystems to provide extra value on top of mm. just the pieces they're building. Mm. And that requires connectivity. Do you think, as you mentioned startups, do you think, um, will MuleSoft play a, play a part in almost um, as a marketplace with the, with the idea of multiple source APIs and um, cross connection, you know. Yes, I mean that's that's where we've been heading, right? Yeah. So we've been actually creating marketplaces within enterprises, so yeah. that people could find and access data and capabilities. Yeah, that's like step one. Okay. Step two is to start opening up some of those capabilities to other parts of the business, so they can self serve and get access directly. Okay. Step three is actually opening up to ecosystems and driving revenue through some of those building blocks. Right. So as an example. Uh, with HSBC, we're driving their transformation program around consumer banking. And what they've done is they've un unbundled their consumer products into a set of APIs. And they now build their, their products on top of those APIs, but they also now offer those APIs internally to other divisions in the bank. 
and that is just started opening up those APIs for developer communities. So it's still early, but they're one of the, mm. the, the few that have really made massive strides in completely unbundling themselves mm. and turn themselves into a, a mini API ecosystem. Mm, interesting. And as you talk about all, so this is a lot of data moving around. So from a GDPR perspective, surely there's, there's consideration for all API builders. Um, is it something that's been on high on your agenda this year? Yes, massive. I mean, I've, I've been talking about GDPR and regulation this year quite a bit because uh, I think everyone in the room knows there's a lot of requirements now around how you, you capture and store customer information. And, and it's an interesting one because it's the first time where regulation is blanketed across mm. everyone, right? Usually it's in financial services or insurance or healthcare, but now we're starting to see regulation hit you know, every industry and GDPR was one of the first to really, you know, actually have a pretty wide berth in terms of who gets impacted. And, and what APIs in that role is, is you need to make sure your APIs are GDPR compliant, okay. which means I know where the data is going and I can actually even stop data moving across certain boundaries through the API oh, okay. contract. But geographically based or in that sort Geographically of based or even system based or okay. even uh, partner based, right? right? I mean, just there's different types of ecosystems that companies operate with. Okay. Um, from the, uh, the startup kind of uh, a startup approach to the API uh, ecosystem, where do you think startups should start? In the sense of, you know, we know what we're, you know, we know our product, we know our connections, we know what we can do. Do they should they focus on creating an API themselves? Do they talk to their customer, to their vendors, and create a reusable API? Then how do they price it? Subscription-based, one-off integration. So what does the business model look like for a startup? Yeah, I think there's two parts to that question, right? First of all, many startups look at their, their product, especially software startups, as the piece of software itself, the app or the, the SaaS application. That's not the product. That's a view of the product. The real product is the APIs underneath. Okay. Those are the channels that persist. And I, some organizations are really good at this. You have founders that get it immediately. Others don't understand it until it's too late and they, they have to go and retrofit a whole bunch of work to, to productize their APIs for their own products, but also for their ecosystem, right? Companies that did this well, um, you know, I mentioned Twilio, but they were one of the first companies to go IPO purely on an API model. Their whole product is APIs and their consumers are developers. Mm. Yet that company is, I think, valued at probably about six billion on the public mm. markets right now, continues to grow, and they, they're leveraging the same model and they're moving very quickly into all sorts of other areas. For, you know, mm. It started with voice, then video, then codecs, and, yeah. and now you know, uh, everything else in between. Yeah. For me, that's the right approach. The, the challenge I think startups have also, and we've seen lots of examples where it didn't work very well, where an API was added, but then they didn't realize the value of the API until much later. So if you're ever following Twitter in the early days, which is sort of 2010, 2011, um, they had this thing called the Firehose and it allowed people like TweetDeck to go and create interfaces on top of Twitter um, to view tweets and work with, with your you know, Twitter um, feeds. Mm. And then one day they decided, actually don't want to do this, we want to shut that off. We think that's actually worth a lot. There's mm. a lot of data in there. And they frankly pissed off a whole lot of people and a, and a big ecosystem of developers. And it's a good example of not understanding that your product is actually the API, mm. right? That's the thing that you end up creating value with because you can put different front ends on it. You can attach different people to that, what I would call a channel. It's really a channel to, to offer products, services, or the, in the case of Twitter, data mm. uh, to other people, whether it's developers or third party businesses. Mm. That's interesting because, you know, in, in a sense, a bit like Apple's App Store happened by accident, you know, with developers and things like that. So what you've highlighted is the opportunity, but is it possible that the negative, uh, the inverse argument could happen in the sense that open source, could that be a, could developing open source, better open source, bigger groups, um, refined products be a challenge to the commercial API space? No, I actually think um, open source is a predicate to it. So, okay. I mean, I started MuleSoft at first as an open source project uh, called Mule. And so I'm pretty familiar with the dynamics of, of open source and, and the way you build up uh, communities. And frankly, if there was a notion of modern APIs now, I wouldn't build open source the way I did it. Mm. I'd actually build 
usable APIs, which is what many startups are doing, right? Mm. If you look at AI engines, mm. most of them are in the cloud and they don't offer an open source distribution for embedding it somewhere. They just give you an API so that you can put in your training data and then your queries and get results back. Mm. As an example, there's mm. a lot of them out mm. there, so it's a good one to look at. Um, so I think open source was a predicate to a APIs because we still use a lot of open source building blocks to build the running APIs that are adding even more value into the ecosystem. Okay. The one thing we haven't covered, by the way, is business models. Yeah. Because open source business models are actually really difficult. Yeah. But API business models are much easier, right? Because you're, you have a much finer control over the contract and how people interact with you because you're running the service. Mm. And when we talk about revenue generation for mm. APIs, a lot of people think money, right? But in the API economy, pound for pound, data is worth more than gold, mm. right? And what you often see is the API is the way to monetize your audiences in ways that uh, just purely paying per tran transaction doesn't happen. Now, Google's a master at this, mm. so is Facebook. Mm. But you're seeing many more startups blend both commercial, i.e. You know, dollar revenue models with other models, right? So you have um, you know, some companies like Stripe actually the API is free, but the transaction on the payments you yeah. pay for, and they reduce the cost. Yeah. For Twilio, you're paying per call on yeah. the API. Yeah. Um, but for someone like, I mean, let's talk about Amazon, yeah. right? Alexa. I don't know. I mean, this was for me one of the biggest shifts in in recent years. I don't know if you saw um, the announcement that um, Amazon put out around Alexa about a month ago, but they launched 70 physical products in one day. A swathe of products. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Physical products that you buy off the shelf or from Amazon, if you don't have a shelf. Um, and what makes that truly fascinating is I haven't seen another product company ever do that. Mm. And the reason they can do it is, it's not the products that they're monetizing. It's not the products that are adding the value. It's the Alexa API that has all the knowledge, all the smarts. And they offer it for free because it, it's a revenue generator to, for two reasons. Mm. One, it allows them to plug into the Amazon ecosystem mm. and buy products and mm -hmm. services. But two, the more products that use the Amazon API, the more Amazon understands about consumer behavior and how, how the home is operating, what people are doing in the home, and they can offer much better products and services than anyone else. So the insights becomes incredibly it's important. Yeah. And actually the products themselves, the, you know, the devices, the connected fridge and the connected uh, microwave yeah. and the, the clock, a really throwaway, yeah. right? Yeah. They're, the, they're the physical thing, but they're not the yeah. thing that add any value. They're yeah. just the, the manifestation of, yeah. of Alexa in a particular room in the house. Yeah, and so, and we don't have a lot of time left, but um, platform as a service then, and what MuleSoft are likely to be doing over the next couple of years, uh, post acquisition and uh, you know, the way after your integration, um, the way you're going to develop that model over the next couple of years without revealing too much, but how do you think um, the MuleSoft offering as a platform, will we have more startups, will we have public-private APIs, you know, it, will there be all that sort of, uh, those components coming together? We're going to do it all, yes. Uh, uh, well, we are, we, so our biggest focus have been enterprises because the biggest challenge in IT today is, is that it's very, very hard to get access to the decades of data yeah. and capabilities that are built up in, in in you know, company IT landscapes that have mostly been on premise for the last 35 mm. years. So we're focused there, but we're doing, because we're part of Salesforce now, I think there's a much bigger opportunity to start doubling down efforts on uh, more startup oriented um, capabilities for, for delivering APIs, okay. delivering a marketplace for APIs. Not, so these are the sorts of areas where, you know, as I look at the next two to three year, years, We'll either have a direct play in that space or we'll have an indirect by providing the APIs that end up powering the next generation of applications. Are, are, are we close to you guys almost offering sort of uh, toolkits for startups and people with expertise and niches and modeling and that, that sort of thing? We're getting there. It's, yeah. it's, it's quite complicated because yeah. the, if you think about an API pipeline, there's quite a bit to it. Plus, developers are very used to building all their own stuff from scratch. So it's got to be easy enough, simple enough to plug in to an existing team, an existing framework. Mm. And that requires productization as well. So we like the idea of it, and I'm pretty sure we're going to head that direction. And it won't just be us. I think it'll be an ecosystem. I don't believe it needs to just be us. What I care about is, is that um, ultimately, as we move into this digital era, that people really understand the value of modern APIs as the way to, to exchange value between 
providers and consumers. So your, your advice finally, uh, think API first. Yeah, I, I, if, as a startup, if I was going to go and build MuleSoft again tomorrow, mm. uh, we've actually done this, but I build every product from the ground up as an API. Okay. And everything we bolt on around it would be, I would think of it as throwaway, not as, as the key product itself. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Russ Mason, founder of MuleSoft. Thanks, Russ. Thank you. <laughs>